Hello, this is Father John Brown, a priest at Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Marietta, Georgia, and welcome back to the series entitled Intro to Orthodoxy. The purpose of this class is to prepare people in our own church who are either considering or planning to become Orthodox, and also to make this information available to anyone who wants to see it on the internet. So let's go ahead and get started. In the last couple of classes, we looked at what the early church fathers had to say about a variety of subjects, and now we're moving to the subject of Holy Communion and what the early church fathers of, uh, set, of the first few centuries said about Holy Communion. Christ established Holy Communion at the Last Supper before his crucifixion. It's a quotation from Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and give thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Before Christ inaugurated Holy Communion, he taught extensively about it in John chapter six. This is a small portion. It's a very extended chapter and very, very well worth reading with a view towards what Christ taught about Holy Communion. This is just a, a portion of that. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Any plain reading of this passage would conclude that communion is supernatural. Like the Old Testament manna, which supernaturally fell from heaven and sustained the Israelites, this manna is also from heaven, as Christ said in this passage. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. Christ also, uh, this, story, this continues, unlike the Old Testament manna, this manna is Christ himself. Christ said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. This manna is not a symbol of Christ. It is Christ. Our Lord himself says in this very passage, For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. The benefit of partaking of this manna is eternal life. As our Lord says in this passage, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up from the last day, at the last day. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. The result of not partaking of this manna as separation from Christ is profound. Our Lord says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The Apostle Paul received Christ's exact words of institution of Holy Communion. It is important to note that he received these words through oral tradition of the apostles, since the Gospels had not even been written yet. He recited them verbatim in his letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul writes, <clears throat> For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul also recognized the supernatural presence of Christ in Holy Communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he writes this, The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 
He also taught the supernatural effects of Holy Communion. It unites worthy communicants to each other and to Christ. He writes in verse 17, For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. But Paul also warned of a possible negative result of improper partaking of Holy Communion. He writes in verses 28 through 30, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. And in this case, when, whenever, very often in the New Testament, when they, someone says, they, it says they sleep, it's as our Lord said once before, that that's a synonym for they, they've passed away, they've died. Now, this, these verses here reject the idea that Holy Communion is merely a symbol, as is often thought. For what symbol can cause death, sickness, and even death? The early church fathers believed and taught what Christ and Paul taught about communion, its supernatural origin, Christ's real presence in it, and its powerful effects upon the soul and the body. Ignatius writes, breaking one and the same bread, which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote to prevent us from dying so that we should live forever in Jesus Christ. He writes elsewhere, I desire the bread of God, the heavenly bread, the life give the life which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I desire the drink of God, namely his blood, which is incorruptible love and eternal life. Justin Martyr writes, We do not receive these as common bread and common drink. Rather, Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise, we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word and from which our, our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. Irenaeus writes, the wine and the bread, having received the word of God, become the Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Christ. Clement of Alexandria writes, the vine produces wine, as the word produces blood, and both of them drink health to men, wine for the body and blood for the spirit. Clement of Alexandria writes, To drink the blood of Jesus is to become partaker of the Lord's immortality. As wine is blended with water, so is the spirit with man. And the mixture of both, of the water and of the word, is called the Eucharist, renowned and glorious grace. Those who by faith partake of it are sanctified both in body and soul. Tertullian writes of communion. He declared plainly enough that what he meant by the bread and when he called the bread his own body. He likewise, when mentioning the cup and making the New Testament to be sealed in his blood, affirmed the reality of his body. Origen writes, we also eat the bread presented to us, and this bread becomes a prayer, a sacred body, which sanctifies those who sincerely partake of it. To the early church, Holy Communion was far more than a symbol. It was an actual sacrifice to God on the same level as the sacrifices of the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul said, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Just as God commanded Israel to celebrate Passover repeatedly as a re-experience of the first, the church celebrates Holy Communion repeatedly where the passion of Christ is re-experienced and made present. The Didache says this about the sacrificial nature of communion. But every Lord's day, gather yourselves together and break bread and give thanksgiving after having confessed your transgressions, that your sacrifice may be pure. But let no one that is at variance with his fellow man come together with you until they are reconciled, so that your sacrifice may not be profaned. For this is the thing that was spoken of by the Lord. In every place and time, offer to me a pure sacrifice, 
for I am a great king, the Lord says, and my name is wonderful among the nations. Justin Martyr also points to the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist, the Holy Communion. God anticipated all the sacrifices which we offer through his name, this name, and which Jesus the Christ enjoined us to offer, i.e. in the Eucharist of the bread and the cup, which are presented by Christians in all places throughout the world. So he bears witness that they are well-pleasing to him. Now that the prayers and giving thanks when offered by worthy men are the only perfect and well-pleasing sacrifices to God. Irenaeus writes, the oblation of the church, which the Lord gave instructions to be offered throughout all the world is considered by God to be a pure sacrifice and is acceptable to him. Cyprian writes, certainly only the priest who imitates that which Christ did, i.e. using wine mixed with water, is the one who truly discharges the office of Christ. He only offers a true and full sacrifice in the church to God the Father when he proceeds to offer it in the manner that he sees Christ himself to have offered it. Holy Communion was also called the Eucharist from the Greek word for giving thanks. It was the central act of collective worship. Not just anyone could preside. Ignatius writes, let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he has entrusted it. There was an established order to it. Justin Martyr writes, and on that day, on the day called the Lord's Day, the Greek word for that is Kiriaki, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs us and exhorts us to imitate these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. And as we have said before, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought. Then the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability. And the people assent saying, Amen. Then the Eucharist is distributed to everyone and everyone participates in that over which thanks have been given. And a portion of it is sent by the deacons to those who are absent. Justin Martyr elsewhere gives us another glimpse at the very early church practice of the Eucharist, our Holy Communion. Having ended the prayers, we, we greet one another with a kiss. Then there is brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water. He takes them and gives praise and glory to the father of the universe. And when the president has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those whom we call deacons give to each of those present the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced to partake of. And they carry away a portion for those who are absent. And this food is called among us the Eucharist or thanksgiving. And no one is allowed to partake of it but the one who believes that the things which we believe are true and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins. There's referring to baptism unto regeneration and who is living as Christ has commanded. The earliest Christians were Jews. Christ, Jesus Christ was a Jew and lived as a Jew every day of his earthly life. Even though he condemned some of the religious leaders of his day for hypocrisy, he never called for an abolition of the practice of Jewish worship. In fact, he fulfilled it in every way. He was born to a Jewish mother. He was circumcised at eight days old in accordance with the Jewish law and was brought to the temple on the 40th day for the appropriate dedication and sacrifice. As a boy, his parents took him to Jerusalem for the required feasts there. He learned to read Hebrew. He studied the Torah. He worshiped and read the scriptures at the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. Judaism was a very liturgical religion. Their order of service was fixed. They followed a strict schedule of required animal sacrifices. They had a series of other services, such as circumcisions, weddings, and blessings. Their services were led by trained and ordained priests and rabbis who wore robes reflecting their office. Their prayers were pre-written. 
they followed a calendar of scripture, of readings and fasts and feast days. Christ's disciples and apostles were also Jews. Like the master, they followed all the norms of Jewish practice. Even after Christ's ascension, the apostles still worshiped in the temple. Therefore, it should not be surprising that the early church worship was very much based on the first century Jewish worship, which was liturgical. The parallels between first century Jewish worship and Christian worship are striking. A study of these parallels would be too extended and complex for this class. However, for those interested, here's an excellent paper on the subject. And I'll pause here for a couple of moments so you can hit the pause button and jot down or, or, or copy and paste. This is a fascinating study of comparison, a comparison between first century Jewish worship and Christian worship also in the first century. The important thing to remember is Judaism was liturgical and so was early Christianity. They, the Christians, had an order of service that was fixed. They followed a schedule of sacrifices of the Eucharist. They had a series of supporting services such as baptisms, weddings, and blessings. Their services were led by trained and ordained bishops and priests. Their prayers were pre-written. They followed a calendar of scripture readings and feast days and fast days. There are also extensive records of the early Christian liturgies. The first began in the first century and were based on the Jewish liturgies. These were developed in the second and third centuries. An example of the second century liturgies can be found in what was what's called the apostolic tradition attributed to St. Hippolytus of Rome. For those interested, the complete text can be read here. So when you, if you, I'll pause you for a moment so you can uh, jot down or hit pause and jot down that website too. But this is, gives extensive insight into the liturgies of the early Christian church as early as the second century. By the third century and early fourth centuries, there were four widely practiced patterns of Christian liturgies. In the East, the liturgy of St. Basil and its successor, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom became the standard and is still used in the Orthodox church today. It was in the first four centuries that the Christian Bible was canonized. That word comes from a Greek word, which means measuring stick and refers to the process of determining the official Bible of the entire Christian church. The first Bible of the Christian church was the Jewish Bible. This was the Bible that Christ quoted and preached. This was the Bible that the apostles quoted and preached to the world. For decades, this was the only Bible because the New Testament had not been written and compiled yet. It is important to know that the Jewish Bible quoted by Christ and preached by the apostles was just not any, was not just any Jewish Bible, but a specific version of the Jewish Bible. The Greek translation of the 70 Jewish scholars is called the Septuagint, sometimes also Septuagint. The original writings of the Jewish Bible were written almost entirely in Hebrew. But two centuries before Christ, the Hebrew language was nearly a dead language, understood mostly by rabbis in Jerusalem. Most Jews in Palestine now spoke Aramaic, and most Jews outside Palestine now spoke Greek. This presented a major problem for the Jewish leaders at the time. Fewer and fewer Jews could read their own Bible. They assembled a group of scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, to translate the Jewish Bible from Hebrew into Greek. Greek was widely spoken throughout the Middle East and Southern Europe because of the conquests of Alexander the Great two centuries earlier. Therefore, most Jews in the Middle East and Mediterranean countries could, all, could Greek, read Greek. It was basically the very closest thing to a universal language uh, then or since. The project of these 70 scholars in Alexandria was completed in the year 132 BC. BC at this point out, this is before Christ. It was called the Septuagint, which means of the 70, because there were 70 scholars who made the translation. The, Sept, the word Septuagint is often abbreviated as LXX, or for the number 70 in Latin. It was widely published and accepted by Christ's time as the official 
version of the Jewish, or I guess because a translation of the Jewish scriptures. The influence of the Septuagint, Septuagint can clearly be seen in the Christian New Testament. Again, the Septuagint came first. The Christian New Testament, every time the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, which it does very often, it cites the Septuagint translation. The Septuagint contained one through four Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, this Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, Baruch, Psalm, Psalms of Solomon and the prayer of Manasseh. The early church accepted the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament as the inspired word of God without question. For the first three centuries, each Christian community had its own list of books that they considered to be divinely inspired. In addition to the Septuagint Old Testament, most local communities also accepted the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as most of the epistles of St. Paul as the Word of God. But again, this was more or less a localized decision, what, what each uh, major Christian community decided for themselves, what they considered to be the Word of God and divinely inspired. The earliest record of a church-wide Bible, specifically including the New Testament books, was by, is reported by the early church historian Eusebius, who mentioned an addition commissioned by Constantine, the first Christian Roman emperor. The oldest copies of the Christian Bible, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sciaticus, may have been two of those Bibles. Both are from that period. So this is a, these are just snapshots of the, if you wanted to know what the two oldest New Testaments are in the world, these are the two of them. Vaticanus is considered to be slightly, they think it's probably slightly older, but they came from the same era. And so these may have been the, those versions of the New Testament that were, that were commissioned by Constantine, uh, the first Roman emperor in the third century. The early church leaders decided to establish a worldwide list of canonical books in the fourth century. There were three criteria they used to select books as divinely inspired and placed in the canon of scripture. When that, again, as a reminder, canon means measuring stick. So these were the approved official recognized books of the New Testament by the Christian church. The first criterion was, was the book written by an apostle or close follower of an apostle? Secondly, is the book already accepted and used by most of the churches in their worship? Third, does the book conform with the accepted traditions of the church? This is kind of striking because many people th think that the traditions of the church uh, were formed by the Bible. Actually, the Bible was shaped to some degree by what was already accepted as the oral tradition of the church before the, the canon was even established. Many books were considered, but they decided upon the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, and this includes, by the way, books Maccabees, Judith, Tobit, and etc., and the books of the New Testament used by all the Christians today. In the Greek-speaking East, the canon used today is first mentioned by St. Athanasios, Patriarch of Alexandria, Andrea, in his Easter letter in 367 AD. In the Latin-speaking West, the canon was established at the Council of Hippo, North Africa, in 393. This council was attended and probably influenced by St. Augustine. It was later confirmed by the Council of Carth Carthage in 397 AD. So now we'll talk a little bit about the persecution of the early church. The early Christian church was pers a persecuted church from its inception. Christ warned his followers of this. He said in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And John, our Lord, says, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. However, Christian animosity soon broke out between the first century Christians and first century Jews. The Christians were frustrated that so many Jews did not recognize Jesus as their Messiah. 
the Jewish leadership was opposed to the claim that Jesus was divine and risen from the dead. They were also concerned that Christians were winning so many converts amongst the Jews. The Jews sought out to have the Christians arrested by the Romans. In fact, the Apostle Paul initially was a persecutor of Christians until he became one. The account of his conversion is recounted in the, books of, in the book of Acts chapters 9 and 26. The book of Acts records several occasions of Jewish persecution of the Christians. Acts chapter 7 says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, this is, this is a St. Stephen, but he, St. Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of the Lord and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then he cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And Acts chapter 12 is another biblical account of persecution of the early Christians by at least the leaders of Judaism at that time. Now at that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. The Jew Jewish persecution of Christians was short-lived. The Jews rebelled against their Roman occupiers who retaliated ferociously. In 70 AD, the Romans conquered or reconquered Jerusalem destroyed the temple, and forced the Jews into exile from the region. In the meantime, the Romans began their own persecution of the Christians. They persecuted Christians because the Christians refused to offer worship to the emperor or any of the Roman gods, which the Romans considered to be treason against the Roman state. They, the Romans, also noticed that the Christians had no idols, which is unthinkable for them, which the, they, the Romans, mistook as atheism. Finally, they heard that the Christians consumed, quote, the body and blood of their founder, which they mistook as cannibalism. The Roman persecution of Christians surged under the Emperor Nero, who ruled between 54 and 68 AD. Nero wanted a large construction project in Rome, but the Senate refused to fund it. On the night of July 9th, 19th, 64 AD, what was called the Great Fire of Rome began. It lasted for five days and two thirds of the city were destroyed. Nero blamed the fire on the small number of Christians in Rome, although it was widely believed at the time that he had set the fire himself to force the construction that the Senate had denied him. According to the, according to the Roman historian Tacitus, he writes this, Following Emperor Nero's command, let the Christians be exterminated. They, the Christians, were made the subjects of sport. They were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs or nailed to crosses or set fire to. And when the day waned, served to burn, to serve, to, to be burned, to serve for the evening lights. As you see there in that depiction of what Tacitus, a Roman, was talking about. Roman persecution of Christians continued for the next 250 plus years. So it's remarkable to think that the Christians were persecuted by the Romans about the same time as, as the United States has existed as a country. The nature of the persecutions varied during that time. Sometimes they were localized. Sometimes they were widespread. Sometimes they were mild. Sometimes they were brutal. The persecutions became more intense with the passage of time. Yet the more the Romans tried to destroy them, the more the, the more the number of Christians increased. There's a fascinating series of letters between Pliny, a, an official in the Roman province of Bithynia, and the emperor Trajan regarding the Christians. It gives an amazing picture of how the Christians were viewed by the Roman government. For those interested, here is the link listed there. Some Christians wrote letters to their Roman persecutors, usually under assumed names for obvious reasons, explaining who the Christians were and what they believed, appealing for the persecutions to stop. One such letter is from a Christian writer calling himself 
Athetes, which is the Greek word for disciple, and obviously a pen name, to a Roman official named Diognetus. A, a link to this letter is here. So I'll pause for a moment so you can hit the pause button and jot, jot these links down if you're interested in the actual original sources of the written and surviving correspondence between Romans, what to do with the Christians, and from the Christians writing through the Roman persecutors, explaining what they really were all about and how harmless they were uh, to the Roman government. This 250 year experience of persecution profoundly influenced the early church. It produced countless martyrs and strengthened the Christian belief in the intercessory relationship between the faithful on earth and the faithful in heaven. Inscriptions like this can be found in the catacombs where Christians were where the Christians buried their dead. And you can, I, I will probably mispronounce this Latin, but piti ora pro nobis pro parentibus pro conjuge pro filis pro sorore, which means in Latin, Peter, pray for us, for parents, for spouses, for sons and daughters. Now that may not be the apostle Peter. It may very well be and probably was that this was a, a Christian named Peter who had been recently martyred. A lot of the inscriptions show names of people with names other than the apostles. And they're probably not at this point talking uh, about or addressing this prayer to St. Peter, but to someone who recently had died. For them, for the early Christians, their strong sense was that when a Christian who they loved and knew and respected had been martyred, that that person went straight to heaven and was still available for intercession to those who they had left behind. So this concludes today's class. Here is my email address. Please feel free to give me a, uh, uh, send an email to me and I will certainly try to answer these questions and stay tuned about a week from today. We will have our next class on our ongoing series called Intro to Orthodoxy. Have a blessed day.